Yesterday, we, uh, at the end of the uh, teaching session, we spoke about the service of the new covenant and what it is that Jesus does for his people in the new covenant, in the divine service, which lies at the heart of the new covenant. Just a little observation. Um, despite the emphasis that's placed on covenant um, by particularly uh, Calvinist theology, and from Calvinist theology, uh, generally in modern theology, uh, there, is not, there are not very many New Testament references to the covenant, the new covenant. But the one emphasis, the one place where it is mentioned and uh, where you get the clearest picture of it is in the words of institution. And if there is one word that tends to be, you know, in all the discussion about the covenant, and if you know anything about biblical scholarship of the last 50 years uh, and more, uh, basically the whole of uh, modern theology has been... Uh, put into two kind of boxes. One is the notion of a personal relationship with God, half-truth, uh, which is not Trinitarian. Uh, and, you know, Mohammedans can have a personal relationship with God and Hindus can have a personal relationship with God. In a sense, everybody has a personal relationship with their gods. Uh, uh, that's not the unique feature of the Christian faith. Uh, but the other uh, uh, emphasis is then, uh, so personal relationship, the other emphasis is, and that very often brought together, uh, on the covenant. Um, and so there's a general notion of covenant, and you talk about uh, the covenant relationship with God. Um, the problem is then immediately you go down that road, it's hard to get away from law. And the emphasis on our commitment to God. Uh, the one clear place where we get a reference to the covenant and where Jesus actually mentions the new covenant is in connection with Holy Communion where he says, take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the remission of sins. New covenant, holy communion belong together. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant in holy communion. And in holy communion he mediates between God and us, God the Father and us, in the New Covenant. New Covenant, Holy Communion. Uh, uh, whenever you teach on it, uh, focus back there. And that's quite clear in Hebrews uh, if you look at it very closely. Now, okay, so we spoke about the priestly ministry of Jesus in the New Covenant. Priestly ministry which straddles heaven and earth. It's in the congregation, but it's in the local congregation, and I'll come to this tomorrow, but at the same time, it's in the heavenly assembly. So uh, the temple of God bridges heaven and earth, straddles heaven and earth, and he mediates then in uh, the new temple of God, which is not built by human hands, but is built by God himself, and is built by God the Father through Jesus uh, as a result of his work. The wonderful teaching of Hebrews is that we as Christians, we as disciples, uh, have the same status as Jesus, liturgically. So we have the same liturgical status as Jesus. To put it quite simply, uh, we go where no high priest ever went in the Old Testament. We have access to those things that no high priest ever have had access to. We have privileges and responsibilities that far surpass the privileges and responsibilities 
of the high priest in the Old Testament. Uh, we, to put it quite simply, and but in a way that Hebrews never actually does, uh, we are not just priests together with Jesus, but we are high priests together with Jesus. Or for, for obvious reasons, however, Hebrews doesn't actually put it that way because then it, it would seem as if you know, we are, have this, uh, exactly the same as Jesus. Right? We are high, have high priestly status only in Jesus, together with Jesus. Apart from uh, Jesus, we have no priestly status, no priestly vocation. Now, all Christians from a baptized infant to the greatest theologian and most pious person have that same status. Uh, we have a high priestly status and we have a heavenly vocation in, as members of the congregation, the Church of God. Um, let, let me just unpack that a little bit. Uh, first of all, we are sanctified by Jesus. Let's have a look at uh, a, a couple of passages uh, which touch on that, and we'll read them um, because of their great importance. Uh, it's a theme that runs all the way through. Uh, just by the way, one of the uh, methods of Hebrews is that he doesn't unpack everything at once. He introduces a topic and then he puts it aside and does some more exposition and picks it up again uh, and gradually rounds off the picture until he makes the final statement. So, uh, so if you wanted to have his teaching on sanctification, you look at all the passages which deal with it, the first one and then going to the last one, which is the summing up. Let me just pick up a few of these. Chapter 2, verse 11. This is the introductory uh, passage. Uh, let me just read verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and through whom all things exist, that is Jesus, who is uh, the creator of the world and is the goal of the world, God's creation, in bringing many sons to glory, might make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Make perfect, remember that's priestly language, ordaining them. So Jesus is ordained as priest through his suffering and death. By the way, suffering in Hebrews never has the idea just of suffering, but suffering death. Right? So he suffers death and he's made perfect by suffering death, which is a bit funny because uh, death ends the priesthood of your normal priest in the Old Testament. In a sense, that's the, not the end of Jesus' priesthood, but it is the foundation basis of Jesus' priesthood. Um, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. They all come from one place. Uh, he who sanctifies is Jesus. Who is those who are sanctified? Every single Christian. So Jesus is the one who sanctifies us. Uh, every Christian is sanctified by Jesus. And we have a common origin. Now it could be uh, that we're all descendants of Adam. Uh, it could be that we are all descendants spiritually of Abraham. Or it could also be that we have one God as our Father. Uh, there's some argument which of these is it is or whether it is a number of these. However, that's just an, uh, 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 a little bit uh, aside here. That is why he, that's Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brothers. Now, um, uh, and, and saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. So Jesus sanctifies us, we are sanctified by him, and we all have, let's just say, the same Father, 
spiritual earthly father, Abraham. We're all spiritual heirs of Abraham, Jesus and us. But we also have God the Father um, as our father. And we are all brothers. Now, um, the emphasis in Hebrew when he talks about brothers isn't on just being members of God's family, with God as our royal father. But the emphasis is on us being brother priests. Uh, in the Old Testament and the Septuagint, uh, brother language is usually in, used in connection with the priesthood. The priesthood was a fraternity, a brotherhood, and uh, uh, all the priests were holy brothers. And that's the emphasis here, that we are holy brothers together with Jesus, and Jesus owns us as his brother priests, as members of his holy priestly fraternity. Uh, and why does he own us as brothers? Not just because God, he, he's a, God the Father has adopted us in baptism, but because he has sanctified us and he has shared his holiness with us. The one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified have one origin. We have God as our Father. And uh, Jesus then owns us, confesses us, acknowledges us as our brother, as his brother priests, together with him. Secondly, can you turn to the beginning, just to the next chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And you'll see uh, somewhat of the same language being picked up. Uh, Always when you're reading Hebrews, notice the chain of argument and the connectors. Uh, I always tell my students, when you see a therefore, uh, 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 ask what it's there for. Uh, okay, therefore, and or the therefore is connects back to Jesus being our high priest, who was made like us in every respect so that he could be merciful, towards us and faithful in his service of God. Um, and he's able to be a great high priest because he was tempted in every respect as we are. Now, therefore, okay, uh, that's the link. Therefore, holy brothers who share in a heavenly calling um, consider, uh, envisage Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. The congregation, every single member of the congregation is a holy brother. And the emphasis is not on us individually being brothers, but on us as a brotherhood, a company of brothers, a band of brothers together with Jesus. Uh, uh, the congregation, Every, the congregation as a whole is a company of holy brothers, the brothers of Jesus, uh, who is high priest. I've mentioned a number of times the importance of uh, uh, this. It's not just for Hebrews, but uh, for almost all the New Testament, particularly for Paul. If you want to follow what Paul's saying, don't focus on his ideas, the concepts, but focus first on the images, the pictures. So justification is not a concept, it's a picture, it's an image. Okay, now here, um, if you think in terms of brothers, okay, what's the, what's the picture here? Um, and we need to get a little bit away from modern ideas, although there's something in common. So. Uh, uh, if you think in terms of people who are brothers, um, what's their, uh, what do they do? Okay, if you, uh, modern terms, okay, basically you, you, you grow up in the same household um, and then eventually you leave home. But in the ancient world, that wasn't the case. If you think in terms of <coughs> what used to be the case on farms, okay, you have a father, you have brothers, and you work together with your father and you work together with your brothers in the business of running a farm. Okay? You have a common 
vocation, you have a common calling, you have a common task. Now, uh, we as holy brothers have a common vocation together with Jesus. And we share in the vocation of Jesus, the calling of Jesus. We uh, have the same status as Jesus, the same holiness. Uh, we have the same God as Father. He is our brother. And together with him, we work. Uh, we have a vocation to fulfill. And what's Jesus' uh, vocation in Hebrews? Elsewhere in the New Testament, it's a royal vocation. You know, he is the royal son of God. We are kingdom people. We are sons and daughters of the heavenly king. And we do the work of the heavenly king. Hebrews doesn't deny that. There's very little reference to that royal aspect of our vocation. The emphasis is on the priestly nature of our vocation. We are co-priests together with Jesus. We form a, just can I finish this and I'll pick you up. We form a priestly brotherhood. Can you go a little bit uh, further to the end of Hebrews? Where he picks up the theme with, and without explaining it, um, because he's already dealt with it. Chapter 13, verse 1, um, at the beginning of his final uh, instruction of the congregation as to how they are to live and work uh, as uh, holy people, he says, let brotherly love continue, let brotherly love remain. Philadelphia, you have a city called Philadelphia, which is named from this passage. Let brotherly love remain. It's not just that we work together as brothers with Jesus, but we are called to share in, uh, 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 to exercise love towards each other. And it is to remain. Hebrews is such a good pastor. He doesn't wag his finger and say, you've got to love each other, as if you don't love each other. But he says, you already do it and let it remain. Just hold on to it. Keep what you've got. Uh, uh, enjoy what you've got. Let brotherly love remain. Now, the brotherly love that he's talking about here is the brotherly love that we have. Uh, no, Jesus' brotherly love for us, our brotherly love for each other as co-priests together with Jesus. Let brotherly love remain. Let Philadelphia uh, remain. Um, one of the themes of Hebrews is uh, the contrast between things, uh, not just imperfect, perfect, but transient, passing, and the things, the things that don't last and the things that do last, the things that remain, the remaining things. And we have this status as holy uh, brothers of Jesus who have a heavenly calling. Now, heavenly calling, okay, we are called to do heavenly work on earth. That's our unique status. And we are called to do heavenly work together with Jesus. We're called from heaven, we're called to heaven, and we're called then to, to uh, uh, exercise a heavenly vocation, living heavenly lives here on earth. Now that's about as radical as you can get. Heavenly lives here on earth. We have a heavenly vocation. Now, as Lutherans, we rightly emphasize vocation very, very much. Okay? But this is one aspect of our classical teaching, at least the way it's filtered down. Um, Luther touches on it, but um, I don't know so many people after Luther who emphasizes it, that we are, are called to our vocation. So my vocation as a pastor, my vocation as a father, my vocation as a husband, my vocation as a grandfather, as a brother, as a worker uh, in our society, is heavenly. I do earthly work, but for the heavenly king. Um, it's, uh, 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 it's not just temporary work, it's not work that's done for time, but it's done for 
eternity. And everything that I do has eternal heavenly significance. So if we like, we have a double identity. There's our earthly identity and our heavenly identity. We don't just begin to live heavenly lives when we die and are raised from the dead. Our heavenly lives begin at our baptism. We are called to live heavenly lives here on earth. Luther puts it quite memorably in connection with the baptism of Jesus when you remember that heaven was opened for Jesus, it was split apart, and uh, you know the uh, Holy Spirit descended on Jesus, and there was the voice of uh, God the Father saying, you're my beloved son, I'm well pleased with you. He says, it's uh, both Jesus and from that point onwards, but also then us who are baptized together with Jesus live under an open heaven. So heaven is opened above us. Now, that's a beautiful little picture which summarizes one of the main uh, themes of Hebrews. We live under an open heaven. Uh, we live heavenly lives here on earth. We have a heavenly calling. We are part of a heavenly community, a heavenly brotherhood. We are this because we are partakers of Christ. Um, can you turn to chapter 3, verse 14 of Hebrews? Uh, uh, I'll just lead into it, verse 12, then through to uh, verse 14. Take care, brothers. Notice the brothers going the way through. Take care, brother priests, lest there be any uh, be in lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort, better, encourage. Encourage one another each day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold on to our original confidence, uh, hold our original confidence firm to the end. Uh, now, we have come to share in Christ. We are sharers in Christ. Uh, and that's to be taken in two ways, is that uh, we uh, uh, share in Christ uh, so that everything that he is, we are. Uh, but we also are partners with Christ. So uh, we are united with Christ. Uh, we have uh, Christ is our common possession. Um, we are uh, koinonoi. We are partakers. We are metechoi. We have Christ as our common possession. What is it that you and I have in common? And the only thing that we really have in common is Jesus. That's what makes us who we are. Uh, that's the basis of our faith. That's the basis of our life. That's the basis of our participation, membership in the church. We share in Christ. Um, but then the, the, that Greek word has a double meaning. It means that we not only share in Christ, but we are partners with Christ. We um, uh, uh, work together with him. We have share in the same mission as Christ. Now, notice the uh, author of Hebrews doesn't say um, we are partners or sharers with Jesus, but we are sharers with Christ. The emphasis is here on him as the anointed one of God, who is anointed with the Holy Spirit as the messianic high priest. So we share in the priesthood of Jesus as the, the Christ, and we then work as priests together with Christ. We are anointed with Christ. We have the same anointing with the Holy Spirit that makes us holy and gives us the same holiness as Jesus. Christ, always remember, is anointed, being anointed then by the Holy Spirit. And 
are always the flip side of being anointed with the Holy Spirit is that we are holy. Um, but we are ho not holy in ourselves. We are only holy in Christ. And as long as we uh, participate in him. Yes. Now. Uh, so I know it says brothers. And I always have a hard time. You know, so first my wife. I want yes. to explain that to her. Yes. How, how then does she fit into the brother idea? Okay, and this is this has some become very very contentious as a result of the feminist movement and the push for inclusive language, and most of your younger guys, uh, most of your uh, Christian friends who are women and even guys, uh, will find it rather offensive that uh, the scripture seems to talk about brothers. Uh, now, uh, one of the ways of getting around that is to say that it's inclusive. Okay, uh, and some translations therefore say brothers and sisters. And that's not wrong. That's one possibility. Um, but uh, 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 that disguises some, a very profound uh, aspect of Christian teaching, which is um, uh, that we are brothers together with Jesus and uh, we are sons together with Jesus. We share uh, in him as our brother. So it's, uh, on the one hand, it's inclusive. On the other hand, our status is um, that we are uh, brothers together with Jesus, who is God's one and only son, just as we are sons and share in the son, sonship of Jesus, so we share in the brotherhood of Jesus. So is that sort of like how Paul describes when it says there is no male or female, He's not saying there's, there's genderless. No, no, this is genderless. That they're united with Christ. Yes, that. yes, right. yes, absolutely. And we have this status, a genderless, um, if you can put it that way, uh, or, yeah, uh, uh, status, uh, because of our union with Christ. So everything that belongs to Christ belongs to us. Any other questions just on that before I'm... Right. Um, now, the congregation is not just uh, the, uh, a priestly brotherhood, but it's also the house of God. Uh, we are God's house, um, says chapter 3, verse 5, provided that we hold fast to our, uh, 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 our freedom of speech to the very end and uh, uh, don't give up the things that we hope for and that we boast as possessing already. So we are God's house and Jesus is the high priest over the house of God. The picture, so, uh, the picture changes, so Jesus is the high priest, we are the house of God. Now um, you get a double reference here. Um, uh, uh, Jesus, we are the house of God, the household of God, meaning part of God's extended family. So God is our father, Jesus is, is our brother, we are siblings together with Jesus. We share in that brotherhood. So that's the one picture, but there's two pictures that come together, is that we are God's house in the sense of temple, the house of God in the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, is the temple of God. And usually um, when uh, the picking the Old Testament refers to the house of God, the temple, it thinks about the whole, uh, if you like, uh, uh, precincts. So you get that the house of God is that whole temple complex. And in that house, you have the naos, which is the temple proper, which is that inner building. Um, so if you like, uh, 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 that's the place, that, that's the heavenly place, is the holy of holies. Uh, the earthly place is the congregation. I don't know, so, uh, but notice how those two come together then in the house of God, because the house of God includes the courtyards of the temple as well as the inner sanctuary. We are God's household. We are God's temple, which means what? That we are holy uh, because God 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit lives in us. Now, the emphasis is not uh, uh, God uh, that our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit or um, uh, temples of the living God, but the whole congregation forming the new house of God. Uh, so what is it that fulfills God's promises about the, his temple and Old Testament? Okay, That is fulfilled in your congregation. Your congregation is the temple of the living God, is the house of God, um, is that holy place here on earth. And the house of God is the place where God lives and the place of, where God interacts with people on earth and people come uh, on earth come to interact with him on earth. They don't have to go up to heaven, they meet with him here on earth. Um, so it's located both in earth and in heaven. Now, uh, the congregation as a whole has access then to God's heavenly presence, the heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly holy of holies, through the flesh and blood of Jesus. Uh, now, that's really amazing. Can you turn to chapter 10, 19 to 20? I'll be coming back to this again because this is a summary passage just leading up to this in chapter 10, the author of Hebrews has spoken about Jesus as the one who has sacrificed himself for us to free us from sins and our impurity and um, so to take away uh, uh, our sin. And he's now seated at the right hand of God. Therefore, chapter 19, therefore brothers, notice brothers again, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is not through his flesh, if you've got it there, scrub that out. Uh, the it's the, it, the uh, new and living way is not through a, some curtain, uh, but is through. Uh, the curtain is the flesh. So we have a new and living way. What's the new and living way? Through the curtain that leads into the Holy Ghost is the flesh of Jesus. Um, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Therefore, brothers, having confidence, having freedom of speech, freedom of access to enter which places? The holy heavenly places, the heavenly sanctuary, heaven itself. And how do we enter these holy places, the heavenly holy places? It's through the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from sin and makes us pure and clean. And then the way into the holy, holy of holies, like the curtain, is the flesh of Jesus. We have the way of entry into heaven itself through the blood of Jesus and the flesh of Jesus. And it's uh, our way of entry into these holy places. Now, it's ambiguous. I'll come to that duly. Uh, we have entry to the holy things as well as the holy places. Next, we have possession of a, an altar, a holy altar from which we receive earthly food, holy food, heavenly. Uh, we don't just receive earthly food, but we receive heavenly food, um, the food of grace. Can we go to chapter 13? 9 to 10. Do not be led astray by diverse and strange teachings, strange in the sense of unauthorized teachings, teachings that have no scriptural basis. For it, for it is good for the heart, the conscience, to be strengthened by grace, not by foods. 
and the term for foods here is earthly foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve at the tent have no right to eat. Uh, we have the food of grace, the food that's given to us as a gift of grace, and that brings the grace of God to us. Uh, uh, and that food comes to us as a gift from God's own altar. And it's a different altar to the temple. So uh, the priests at the temple never had food from this altar, but we have food from this altar and we receive this holy food. And see what follows then. Uh, for the bodies of those animals whose blood was brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin, that's the, the bodies of the animals as sin offerings, were burned outside the camp. They were never eaten. You didn't eat the bodies, the meat from sin offerings. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his blood. So you get food from this altar and blood from this altar, blood which sanctifies our bodies. So what is it that makes and keeps us clean? Holy food, but also holy blood. The holy blood of Jesus, the sin offering for us. I made this, or I was thinking past this yesterday, but as you commented on the, uh, the context, both Roman uh, and uh, the Roman context to which this, this, yes. this, this uh, yes. sermon is written, uh, but also uh, in context of the of, of Jewish people in that yes. context. Yes. Um, and it, I almost asked about what you thought, I don't know, what you thought took preeminence that the, because here it seems like the polemic is like clearly against the existing temple in Jerusalem and the, the altar, like the, the, the distinction between that old altar from which even the high priest cannot eat yes. and the Christian altar from which one can. So I guess my question is, do you think the Roman context is um, it's sort of to the forefront or that it's more, that Hebrews is much more a polemic against, against Jerusalem and the cult that's still at this point? An excellent question, um, and it's always good to you know when you're, you're reading some uh, uh, any passage, say in the epistles, to not only see what it's saying, but what it's directed at correcting, uh, what it's against, what its front is. Now, um, I would avoid, in connection with Hebrews, I'd avoid the term polemic because the author of Hebrews doesn't have a single polemical bone in his body. He doesn't attack anybody. I defy you to find a, a passage where he attacks anybody or even anything. That's not his method. Um, he always thinks positively, not so much negatively. And that doesn't mean that he's not aware of uh, you know, evil things like sin, unbelief, uh, apostasy, all those kinds of things. Uh, but he, uh, his emphasis is, is always to lead people from uh, what's um, uh, temporary, unsatisfactory, uh, what is fake, to use the term of your great president, uh, to what is fake and <laughs> doesn't deliver what it promises to the, either the real thing or the better thing. So the polemic is, if you like, the front is not an attack on the temple in Jerusalem, but leading from what's good, the temple in Jerusalem, to the new temple and the new sacrifices and the new food that we have in Holy Communion. And even when he talks about, we, and, and verse after this, we have here on earth no abiding city, but we look for the one that's to come, uh, is clearly a, uh, a barb directed at uh, Rome's pretensions. The fake claims of Rome, like the fake claims of Trump to make America great again, um, as if you make America great and... Uh, 
as if America ever was great in the sense that he wants to talk about it. It's a phony claim. And what he does then is just gently debunks that phony claim of Rome being an eternal city. I guess, I do understand, I guess my question is, do you think that, he, that the people that he's preaching to yes. would be tempted to migrate back to the, to, to their old, to the old temple-centric ways? I guess that's... Yes, I, you know, there's always a nostalgia, uh, nostalgia for the past, even the bad past. Like East Germany, there's a nostalgia for the old communist regime. Um, because uh, most of the people who are uh, living there have forgotten how bad it was. Uh, uh, and always when you look back, you see the good old times. Now, the good old times were never good old times. They were just old times. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have that tendency to, to look back into the past and, and in nostalgia, see only the good things. And that's very important for us human beings so that we don't carry baggage with us. Um, and uh, uh, so, yes, the, this is a Jewish Christian congregation. Uh, now, practically speaking, probably never of the, none of them had ever visit, visited Jerusalem or participated in temple worship. Uh, but there might be some nostalgia saying, yeah, you know, it would have been good. And look, this is so concrete and, you know, God engages with us so concretely here. Um, now, the Christian faith is so airy-fairy. Uh, I think there's a little bit of that. Um, but that's not his main concern. Um, to, uh, uh, no, he, or to put it quite clearly, to, as simply as I can, he emphasizes the positives rather than the negatives. And he leads people gently to uh, what is the very best. Yes? In your commentary, you make a passing comment about all of the sacrifices of the Red Heifer being burned outside of the camp and that Jesus' body wasn't burned. Is there is any more to unpack behind that in terms of what that means? Yes, look at the commentary. and that's, uh, Because I'd have to go through the Old Testament stuff, and that's a bit of an aside. Um, yes, uh, the, you know, the, what, what's more important is this, that the body, the flesh, the meat from a sin offering was never eaten by anybody. Why was it never eaten by anybody? Because it, it uh, uh, was the means by which the impurity, the sin of people was removed. And uh, the people who offered the sacrifices couldn't be the beneficiaries of it in that sense. So uh, it was burnt. It was, it was uh, removed from human use. Now, what's, you always look in Scripture for the unexpected, the surprising thing. Um, just to give you one case in point, and then I'll come to this. The most scandalous, amazing thing that Jesus ever said to his disciples was on the Last Supper where he said, take and drink, this is my blood of the new covenant. Now, his disciples knew that there was an absolute taboo on the drinking of blood. Uh, animal blood and human blood is even worse. Okay, so what's the most surprising word that Jesus ever said was, take and drink, this is my blood. And unless you're scandalized by that, you can't get the, 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 the full force of that and appreciate uh, exactly what it is that Jesus is giving us by giving us his own lifeblood. Um, in the same way, um, uh, one of the surprising things is that Jesus is our sin offering, who pays for our sin, uh, but we who have Jesus as our sin offering eat his body. Uh, he becomes sin for us so that uh, we might be released from sin. That's the emphasis there. But how am I going? Um, the congregation has access to God the Father through Jesus. Can you turn to chapter 7, verse 30, uh, 25? Chapter 7, verse 25. 
Um, I'll pick it up in verse 23. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues, he remains forever. Notice the word remain again. He remains forever. Consequently, therefore, he's able to save to the utmost, completely, totally, utterly, uh, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Um, Jesus is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him, together with him. So it is through Jesus and with Jesus that we are able to approach God. We don't approach God by ourselves. We don't approach God by ourselves singly, me to God, or we don't approach God as a congregation by ourselves, but we always approach God, we are drawn near to God, together with Jesus, through Jesus. Um, that word through, that preposition through, is one of the most important ones uh, in the New Testament. Uh, it doesn't just mean we draw near to God because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Uh, it doesn't just mean that we approach uh, 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 God the Father because of what Jesus gives us, but we approach God through him, which means that together with him, we approach God. And we can only approach God together with him. So he's our high priest. He's offered himself for us. He cleanses us from sin. He makes us holy. And so we as holy priests, members of his holy priesthood, as members of his body, we are able to approach God through him. And to make that easier for us, he continues to intercede for us. And that's the basis of our salvation. And that's the basis for our part, uh, approach to God the Father in the divine service. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, you have somewhat the same thing in chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. Fifteen, sixteen. Um, that comes immediately after the uh, statement that we have here on earth no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come through him then, this is the conclusion, through Jesus, let us continually, probably regularly or daily approach, no, where am I? Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Uh, we don't offer the sacrifice of praise. We don't offer praise to God by ourselves, but we offer it as we present this offering of thanksgiving and praise through Jesus, together with Jesus. We confess Jesus, we acknowledge him as our high priest, and we also then praise God we offer the sacrifice of praise together with Jesus, through Jesus. He's the one who leads us in our praying. He's the one who leads us in our praise of God. So we offer the sacrifice of praise through Jesus. He is the one who is our mediator. He is the one who helps us to offer this sacrifice of praise as part of the holy priesthood. You remember that, and I spoke about this last session, that part of the priesthood, um, the, the priests were divided into two groups. There were the priests, the Aaronic priests, and then there were the Levites. The Levites were the assistants of the priests. Um, and one group of Levites were the praise singers, the Levitical choir. And so uh, uh, praise singing is a priestly responsibility. It's a priestly activity. And praise singing is always done at the temple in the presence of God. And the people who offer praise to God are a fraternity, a praise singing They are holy people. Uh, so they offer uh, 
praise to God at the temple. We are now, to change the picture, part of a choir. A choir that uh, sings the praise of God in the presence of God, just as the Levitical choir sang the praise of God at the temple in Jerusalem. But we, the temple that we offer this uh, sacrifice of praise is the heavenly temple. We are part of the heavenly choir, which consists not only of the members of our congregation, but the whole communion of saints on earth and those in heaven and the angels as well. So it's part of that huge choir. Uh, we are members of this heavenly choir as priestly people. So as priestly people, we are praise singing people. And the most important offering that we send, uh, offer to God as priests is the sacrifice, the offering of praise. Um, that's what we do every Sunday. We gather together to present the offering of praise to God the Father through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, and most importantly, as holy priests, we are involved we, in the divine service, the service uh, uh, that's offered to God, the divine service. Now, uh, this service occurs in a double location. Okay, last Sunday, where did you offer, where did you participate in the divine service? It was in your local congregation. But do you realize at the same time, uh, you were performing the divine service uh, uh, in heaven itself. Uh, and that you were uh, performing the divine service together with Jesus, to God the Father, you were together with the Holy Spirit, together with all the angels who are liturgizing spirits. They assist, assisted you in your service. Uh, so uh, uh, we serve God, we participate in the heavenly liturgy, the heavenly service, and we offer the uh, divine service here on earth to God in heaven, uh, together with all the communion of saints and all the angels. 